This is 141, and I'm going to talk about RSA today and then demonstrate a few projects. And there's only a few more classes. Next week, I'll, I'll talk about quantum computing that's not in your book and have a demonstration of the quantum computing project. I got that working today. The only trick is to install some strange Python libraries, and I found an online Python environment that works for that, which is good because it's too hard to install locally. There's only a few more classes, and then the end. I also posted in Canvas today the chart to calculate your final grade, so you can see how you're doing. Many people are interested, so uh, you just have to get a certain number of points, and then you'll get a good grade. So let's take a look at uh, 141. RSA. This was the original public key cryptography system that changed the world. So we'll talk about the math behind it, and uh, how you encrypt and how you sign, and then how things can go wrong. So the math is very simple. It's one of the many great things about RSA. It's not very complicated. It's pretty easy to understand, and it is the basis of what most of us are using for public key encryption even still. So you have to understand a group. A group, Zn star. This is the group, which is all the integers modulo n. So it goes, now in order to be a group, it has to have an identity element one, and um, it has to have, every member has to have an inverse. So you can't include zero because zero times something would be zero and there's no way to reverse that. So Z4 contains one and three only. It would contain one, two, and three, all the numbers from one up to four, but not including four, but it doesn't include two because uh, four is a multiple of two. So if you take two and two squared and two cubed, you just keep getting two over and over, two and four over and over. So two has no inverse. So uh, the group with of the numbers up to four, the, the list of numbers up to four contains three elements, but the group up to four contains only one and three. So if n is prime, um, if p is prime, I should say, really, then c star p contains all the numbers up to p minus 1. And if it's a prime, then there's no issue of having a number without an inverse because there's no way uh, multiplying these numbers together will ever hit um, a repeating pattern. So if you had a prime number, then you just have all the numbers from 1 up to the peak. So 5 being a prime number, 1, 2, 3, 4 would be in that group. This would be a handy group to use, but we're not going to use any groups like that in RSA. The ones we're going to use in RSA are like this, the product of two primes. 10 is 2 times 5. So the group Z star 10 would contain the numbers from 1 to 9, but it's only going to include the ones that have no inverse. And you can see 2, 4, 5, 6, and 8 are excluded because they're not relatively prime with 10. That's how you check them. If this can be divided into that evenly, then you cannot use it because then it will not hit all the numbers as you multiply it by powers. This will only hit the even numbers and go around and around. 5 will only hit 5 and 10, 5 and 10, 5 and 10, and so on. So these ones uh, are not part of the group. So Euler's totient is the number that measures how many numbers you can actually use in this group. Z star n, it's actually extremely simple. If n is the product of prime numbers, then Euler's totient is the prime number minus 1 times all the prime numbers minus 1 multiplied together. So for z star 10, it's the, it's a, the, the n of the group is 10, which is 2 times 5. So Euler's totient is 1 times 4. It's this, the smaller number you call p, and the larger prime you call q. And this is p minus 1 times q minus 1. So there are only four elements in the group. All you do is you take all the elements, and you, it's easy to understand. You, you take away uh, p1 the prime number, that's how many uh, match the uh, multiples of the first prime, and this is how many match multiples of the second prime, and there's one of them, I think it's a zero, it's one that is included twice, so that's why you have a minus one in it. So anyway, um, so here's the RSA trapdoor permutation. You have a modulus n, which is the product of two primes, p and q. You pick a public exponent, which in practice you usually just use this number, and that's the public key, is n and e. That's all you tell the public. In private, you know the prime number it was built from. That's p. And if you know p, you can find q by taking n over p, and you can find various other values from it. And that's including the value you need to decrypt messages. So if x is the plain text message and y is the ciphertext, to encrypt a message, you take x to the e mod n. e is that number that's almost always just 65537, just an encryption key, key. And n is the exponent 
is the uh, modulus number, which is the product of two primes. So you encrypt by taking x to the e mod n, and you decrypt by taking the ciphertext to the d mod n. And d is the decryption key, which you can find if you know p and q, but in order for this to be secure, it has to be too difficult to find if you don't know p and q. That's why they call it a trapdoor. You can send a message in, but nobody can pull that message out without the decryption key. And so to calculate d, e times d has to be 1 mod phi, um, because phi is the actual number of elements in the group. It's less than n. It's p minus 1 times q minus 1. So to decrypt, um, you take y to the d mod n, and y is x to the e, so that's x to the ed mod n, and ed is going to get you back where you started. That's the point of it, because there are only phi elements in the group. So if you take any member of the group and you raise it to the phi power, it will go all the way around and come back to where it started. That's why it works. So that's the point, and this is called Fermat's Little Theorem, also Euler's Theorem, this statement that any element of a group raised to the phi power will always just come back to 1. All right. So um, we can do a couple examples. For n equals 10, we talked about. So the um, 10 is 2 times 5, so p is 2 and q is 5. So phi is p minus 1 times q minus 1. That's 1 times 4, so there are four elements in the group. Now, every element of the group you can use to generate the group, so we can take 3. 3 is a generator of the group, and the way a generator works is you just multiply it by number, take it to power. So 3 to the 1 is 3. 3 squared is 9, so now we've found 3 and 9. Then you take 3 cubed, that's going to be 27. You take it modulus 10, that's 7, so now you've found 7. Then you take 3 to the 4th, that's 81. Modulus 10, that's 1, and these are the four elements of the group. So um, all you have to do is start with a generator and raise it to successive powers, and you will generate all the elements in the group. And therefore, if this was your plain text message, x equals 3, you would raise it to these powers, and that's how you would encrypt it and decrypt it. So here's the powers of 3, 3 to the 1, 3 to 2, 3 to 3 to 4, same thing we just did. And 3 to the 4th is 1, so 3 to the 5th is 3 again, so it's just going to go around this pattern of numbers, 3971, 3971, forever. It's a generator of the group. So you encrypt by raising a message to the power E, forming Y, and you decrypt by raising Y to the power D, returning the original plain text X. So we want to find D. And the rule is E times D has to be 1 mod phi, and phi is 4. So 3 times 1 mod 4 is 3. 3 times 2 is 6 mod 4, that's 2. 3 times 3 is 9, that's 2 fours plus 1. So 3 times 3 is 1. That means the decryption key is also 3. So you can encrypt a message by raising it to the third power, and you can decrypt it by raising it to the third power again. So if I have a message, and my message is, say, 3, I encrypt it by taking 3 to the 3 mod 10, which is 7. So the encrypted message is 7, but to decrypt it, I take 7 to the 3 mod n, that's 343 mod n, that's back to 3. So that's the game, and of course with these small numbers of n, you're not accomplishing anything, but it shows you how it works. And the math works just the same, even for big values of n, where you cannot do it without knowing the, the, the prime factors. So if we get a little bigger, we can go up to n equals 14. 14 is 2 times 7. So if you take x equals 3 again, we're just going to take it to various powers. 3 to the 1 is 3. 3 squared is 9. 3 cubed is 27 mod 14. So that's 13. It's 28 minus 1. There's one way to look at it. 2 14s minus 1. Um, 3 to the 4th is 81. So that is... Uh, 14 times 5 is 70, so it's 5 14s plus 11. So you get to 11 here. And 3 to the 5th is 243, and that turns out to be 5. 3 to the 6 is 729, and that is 1. So there you are. Those are the six elements in the group, uh, all generated by raising 3 to various powers. And, if you, and this is the 3 to the 6 takes you back to 1, so... Um, You've got it back to the identity element. So here's the powers of 3, going up to 3 to the 6 being 1, 
and there's the pattern it goes through. So three is the generator of the group, and there's the pattern of numbers. So now if I want to encrypt a message of three with an encryption key of five, then I would encrypt the message. Um, and to find the decryption key, I have to take find the D such that ED is one mod five. The E is five, and so I just try multiplying five by various numbers, and I find out that five times five mod six is one because it's 24 plus one. So five again is the decryption key as well as the encryption key. They aren't always the same. They just happen to be for these uh, small number examples I've chosen here. So to encrypt a message of three, you raise it to the fifth power, mod n, and that gives you five. And then to decrypt it, you raise it to the fifth power again, mod n, and that gives you the original message of three. So that's how it works. All right, so now you just have to do it with longer, longer keys in progress. Uh, to generate the key, you have to pick random primes, p and q, then multiply them to get n, calculate phi, pick an e, which just has to be any number that's relatively prime of these, and typically you just choose a prime number like 3 or 65, 5, 37. And then d is the inverse of e, mod phi. So you can do it with PyCryptodome in Python. Just import RSA and use RSA generate to generate the key. And then you can use Cypher encrypt to encrypt and Cypher decrypt to decrypt. So it's pretty easy to do. And so here it is being done. Your Cypher, your, in, your plain text is say encrypt this message. And uh, this is a padding scheme we'll talk about a little later. And then we tell you, when you encrypt it, it turns into this unreadable hexadecimal junk. That's what it does. And this is a 2048-bit key, so this is reasonably secure. And so the message is quite long, about as long as the key. And uh, you can decrypt it, and you get back to the original message. So the calculations, here's how the calculation can compare. To do a key generation takes quite a time. Um, for, it takes, I guess, a seventh of a second to do one 1,024-bit key. That's because generating a key is a really slow process because you have to hunt and find some prime numbers. And you have to try perhaps hundreds of guesses before you find the prime numbers. That's what slows it down. But to encrypt is very fast. All you're doing is raising something to a small power, E, and you choose the encryption key to be small. So this is just math, so it's much faster. See, only uh, 26 milliseconds for 400 encryptions. And to decrypt is much slower again. Uh, you can only do maybe five RSA decryptions, and that's taking about half as long as 400 encryptions. And that's because you chose a small e to make encryption fast. And if you make e small, then d gets big. So the, tip, the way you typically do it is you choose a small e, and you accept that d will be much bigger and slower. So you can do it in Python. And this is how you... Um, yeah, this, will just, this one will just uh, try various lengths. 2048 times uh, 1, 2, 4, 8, 16. This is how I did it. And then start a clock and, and calculate how long it took to generate the key and print them out. So when I ran that script, it gave me this answer. Um, for 2048, it took 0.3 seconds. 496 took 1.2 seconds. 81.90 took 81 seconds. This took 1,400 seconds, and this took about 1,400 seconds. There's some variation. So you see, it gets to take a really long time. This is a minute, and this is like 15 minutes just to calculate one key. So long keys get very unwieldy with RSA. All right, so to encrypt with RSA, uh, you typically do not encrypt your plain text directly. Um, you could in principle, but in fact, nobody wants to do that because, as you can see, it can be time-consuming to encrypt with RSA. So rather than that, you just encrypt an AES key to deliver it, and then once that's delivered to the other end, you just encrypt with AES, which is much faster and perfectly secure, just as secure, as long as you don't lose the key. So uh, textbook RSA, which is what we're using in the simple projects here, you convert your plain text to ASCII bytes, that's a number, you can read it in hexadecimal, interpret it as a number, and put it in x, and then calculate x to the e mod n to get another number. That's textbook RSA. Now, it has some serious flaws. Here's one of them. If I encrypt two plain text messages, they're just numbers x1 and x2, then I have y1 and i2 
is x to the e mod n, but that means if I have the ciphertext here, I could multiply those ciphertexts together, and I would have the correct ciphertext for multiplying the two plain texts together. So I can create a valid ciphertext without the key. Um, I don't know what it is, but it's not a very nice system when I can use the ciphertext and I can use it to construct another ciphertext which will still be valid to decrypt with the key. That's, uh, we'll talk about one coming up, the existential forgery attack is a similar. This is a weakness of the system. Um, you would like a, a cryptographic system so that if an observer steals the ciphertext, they cannot forge any message that will decrypt. And that is not true of textbook RSA. So to prevent that, you use padding, optional, optimal asymmetric encryption padding. You pad the plain text to be as long as the key, and this includes extra data and randomness. And now, this means that there is a, uh, you cannot co combine, they have details of the algorithm, which I don't think I'll go through, but the point is, and now you padded it with stuff, and you'll be able to remove it when you decrypt, but now you cannot take a couple of these and multiply them together and create a properly padded message. The padding solves that problem of being able to construct a uh, valid ciphertext from ciphertext only without the key. Now there was an older system, PKCS number 1, version 1.5, created by RSA. It was um, announced in the 70s when RSA came out, and a lot of people use it, but it's much less secure. And a lot of people say it's obsolete and we should quit using it and instead use this one, OAEP, instead, which is better. So you can sign a message with RSA as an alternative to encrypting it. Now to sign a message, you send a message X, and then you calculate Y, X to the D mod N, using the decryption key, which nobody else knows. So nobody else can create this because they don't have the decryption P, but anybody can verify it because the public key is E. So all they have to do is take Y to the E mod N and they'll get X. So they can verify that this message is signed. Now they can only do this if they know X. So this is not a confidentiality solution. This is a signature. You have a public document like a loan agreement and then you have a digital signature attached to it which proves that the holder of the private key signed it. It does not make it a secret, it just means that it was signed by the person who held the private key and it has not been modified. So it serves the purpose of a legal signature. That prevents forgeries, but it doesn't provide confidentiality. Now normally you don't sign the whole message because your message might be a page of text and that's too big a number, so what you do is you hash it and then you sign the hash. So the hash is a short enough thing to fit in an RSA um, in calculation more easily. So textbook RSA signatures, you just sign a message X with Y is X to the D mod N, and now, in principle, an attacker can forge signatures. Some values like 0 and 1 for X, of course, will have an obvious, it doesn't matter what power you take, 1, 2, or 0, 2, you'll always get the same answer, and there's some similar issue with N minus 1. So in that case, the attacker can forge some valid signatures. And there's another one, too. If you could, if you want to get the signature for message M, which the user would never willingly sign, if you can find a value r such that r to the e times m mod n is a message they will sign, then you can get them to sign this message and you can calculate the other signature from it. So this is like the previous attack. Because textbook RSA does such a simple mathematical exchange, you can use some of the information you know to forge signatures. And so again, if you have a proper signature scan, uh, standard with padding in it, then you're not going to be able to do that. You cannot take signatures from other messages and combine them to get a proper signature for new message because the padding, again, has some random bits in it, and you're not, and it's not going to accept combining a two of these. It's the same, so that's the PSS signature standard, probabilistic signature standard, which makes the signatures more secure. And there's something called full domain hash signatures, where all you do is hash it, and then sign it. And again, this will uh, solve the problem because if you were to combine a couple of these signatures, you'd just be combining hashes and it would turn into garbage. You wouldn't be able to know what message matched them. So you cannot forge that one either. All right, Prog PSS came later. It's in theory more secure. In practice, they're both perfectly fine because the hash function, uh, you know, obscures the message so that combining two hashes is in no way related to combining the two messages, which is what you would need. 
and PSS is actually safer against injected fault attacks, which are as a hardware side channel attack that we'll talk about. So then there's just the issue of how you implement RSA in practice. In practice, just use libraries. Do not write your own RSA code. The general rule I've mentioned many times, don't write your own crypto. Use standard libraries that have been tested and written by experts. Uh, it is the wise thing to do. You're too likely to make a mistake doing it yourself. And now there's an, consider RSA with a 10 to 24 bit key. You'd have to calculate like X to the 1024. So if you did a multiplication, you'd have to do 2 to the 1024 multiplications, which is an impossible number. You know, we can't even do 2 to the 72 calculations with all the computers in the world. So you don't do it that way. Um, what you're trying to do is raise x to a large power mod n. And since you are, what you do is you use square and multiply. You calculate x times x, and then you multiply x2 times x2 to get the fourth. So all you do is you get powers of 2 here. So now you have these numbers, and you can combine these to make any exponent. Instead of doing this by doing 512 multiplications, you double and double and double the number of the power of the exponent. So you'll end up with, uh, with only doing a small number of calculations. So now you can do a 1,024-bit exponent with only 1,500 multiplications, which is quite reasonable. You do not have to do 2 to the 1024 multiplications, just um, 1,500 multiplications, which is not too much. Of course, each one of those numbers is a big number, 1,024 bits long, so it takes some CPU, but it is possible. So we talked about side channel. The reason, um, now the speed up of this means that exponent bits of 1 take more time than exponent bits of 0. And that means if you measure power consumption or timing, I can leak out information about the key, which we've talked about before. Any efficient algorithm that skips steps that are not necessary will therefore leak information about the key. So you, if you want to avoid this, you have to write an equal time algorithm that doesn't ever skip any steps, even when it could, to make sure that the total amount of time is, is always the same, regardless of the key. All right, there is a library called EverCrypt from Microsoft that claims that it is completely safe and can never leak information. So uh, they have somehow made one that supposedly has a very strong version of this equal time property. All right. Anyway, I mentioned before, if you make E small, then the encryption will be fast because you're raising it to a small power, and decryption will be slow because if you make E small, D generally gets larger. So the Chinese remainder theorem, by the way, makes it four times faster. There is a way to, um, instead of doing one operation mod N, you take the fact that N is the product of P and Q and this strange construction can be done to end up working with smaller numbers and make it faster. Just a way to make the calculation a little bit faster. So, things that can go wrong. Um, this is the Bellacore attack. I remember I was very excited when I read this. Somebody cracked a 512-bit RSA key with only 100 encryptions because they lowered the power supply so the CPU would drop bits. And if the CPU drops one bit during the calculation, that does not have a random effect on the output. It, in fact, can be used to deduce information about the key. So, uh, by the way, cosmic rays hit your computer and cause bits to flip every now and then. So, in principle, you could do this without even altering the power supply, but it would take a long time. So, if you wait for the CPU to make mistakes, then you can break deterministic schemes. But a probabilistic scheme, like PSS, it won't work because part of it is just random. So if you do the same calculation over and over, you don't get the same answer anyway. So now if a bit is lost and you get the wrong answer, it's not as useful to you because you, you can't easily tell what the answer would have been. So that's uh, one attack that the probabilistic scheme is more secure against than, say, the hashing scheme, which if you encrypt the same thing over and over, it will always give you exactly the same answer. So. That's it for this stuff. Let's take a look at a Kahoot. All right, there it is.
hopefully we can get at least one more. Otherwise, the competition aspect is compromised. I'll give it another few seconds. Aha, huh, good. Well, that'll do. That's better than, than three. All right. All right, so how many elements are in Z star N for N equals 15? It's three, uh, it is, excuse, it's eight, because this is three times five, so you take two times four. P minus 1 times Q minus 1, and you get 8. So nobody got it right, but that's what it is. It's going to be, you take N, which is the product of two primes, 3 times 5, and you take P minus 1 times Q minus 1. P is 3, and Q is 5. So P minus 1 is 2, and Q minus 1 is 4, and 2 times 4 is 8. All right, what's Euler's totient for 35? <laughs> All right, so you got one right. It's the same thing. Euler's totient is P minus 1 times Q minus 1. 35 is 5 times 7, so it's 4 times 6, 24. Feel free to ask questions if there's anything I can do to help. Um, just want to get some lumps off my touchpad. All right. Anyway, all right. So how do you save time on the client side in RSA? Encryption key small. This is what happens. You want to log into Google. You get Google certificate that is Google's public key. You encrypt your password, or really it's encryption key. You encrypt something with that, with a low E on your weak device. It might be a cell phone, and it goes up to Google. They decrypt it on a powerful server with D. So a small E and a big D means Google does most of the work, and you only have to do a little bit of the work on your client by making E small. All right. And what's the slowest operation in our show? And generating the key is the slow process. Because it's a random process, you have to hunt for prime numbers. The rest of these are just calculating formula. But key generation is slow. All right. Well, we have only two winners. Let's see. There's XC. I know that is. All right. Good. Good. We've got three people. Good. Good. Okay. Good. All right. Good. So let me stop the recording.